government job. Two people working and 60 people watching. Welcome allemaal aan Prins Hendrik Laan, 36, 38. In het Polish familie Stolperstein ceremony. Dus einde het Nederlandse portie van deze school. <laughs> How very appropriate that today, May 4th, is Doden Herdenking Dag. How equally important is tomorrow, May 5th, Bevrijdingsdag. Because this is a story of Doden Herdenking and befriding from the Frolish family. Our family thanks you all for attending this remembrance ceremony. And we also remember the dearly departed from the Asberg, the Schipper, and the Elders families. One second, can you all hear us or do we need to talk louder? A bit. Page louder. Page louder. Thank you. You can come close, come close. Yeah, yeah, much, much, a bit of we, we hope that you will join us for a reception afterwards at the Blauete House nearby, about 15 minutes walk uh, in Vondel Park. And if you come with us, all you need is this armband and everything comes with it. So please. Um, and we would like you to come because that's where we can share stories and discussions of what we know. I want to begin by thanking Amanda Gann from the Stichting Stolperstein for organizing these four stones and their placement by the city of Amsterdam. Amanda, there is a place in heaven for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes. I would also like to welcome Nancy Adler here behind us from Nyon, although it's changed its name, I guess, uh, the Netherlands Institute for Orlog Documentation. And but uh, she handles the Institute for War, Holocaust, and Genocide Studies, and who continues to remind the world of past tragedies and document events today. An all too present reminder as Europe once again hangs under the pall of war. Finally, I want to recognize my sister Agnes, <laughs> who pieced together the fragments of lives and much correspondence to complete a labor of love called Sabine's Odyssey, to tell the harrowing and heroic story of death and survival. And Agnes will give a talk after I finish my speech. <laughs> not yet, Agnes, not yet. <laughs> We're here because the crucible of world war and racism caused our four families to interact. The Fröhlich family were refugees from Breslau, Germany, who came to this address, 3638 Prince Hendrik Lahn, in 1939, while awaiting immigration visas to travel to the USA. The children Andreas and Sabine attended the nearby St. Ignatius College and, and the Roman Romana Catholica Lyceum for Mages. Georg, Edith, and the children became trapped in Amsterdam when the Nazis invaded Holland on November, on May 10th, 1940. As you look here up at the doorway 
of 36 Prince Hendrik Lahn, you can see the little round window alcove where at times my mother Sabine hid whenever someone came to the door of the house in 1941 and 1942. As you look at the doorway of 38 Prince Hendrik Lahn, you can see where the plainclothesman policeman came to pick up Andreas Frolich in the second Razia of Amsterdam in June of 1941. If you are a member of the Osber family, please raise your hand. Wow. <laughs> that is Cavelda. The large and ever growing Han and Jo Osbert family were neighbors who lived around the corner and whose children, two of whose children, attended school with Andreas at St. Ignatius and with Sabine at the Roman Catholic Lyceum. Om Han, I called him Om Han. <laughs> you call him Grossfather, Father, Gro worked in publishing and outgever. His ability to make up stories and to print false identity papers saved the Frohlich family. It was particularly after Andreas was picked up in 41 and later died, died four months later in Mauthausen, that Omhan stepped up all his activities. He helped George, Edith, and Sabine go into hiding. If you look on Sabine's stone here, you can see she was Onderdauken in Budel, and that was through Omhan and his contacts to create false identity papers that Sabine was actually named Lisha Schmidt and came from Indonesia. Oh, yeah. It's a remarkable story, and Omhan had some relations and family in that connection. And that's where Omhan drove Sabine to first hide. If you are a member of the Schipper family, please raise your hand. Remember. There we go. It's so great to have you here. The Schipper family mostly Vestfries boars and Bolin boars from Hochgospel and Vestvaugs in North Holland. And the Schippers became caretakers of the Ondergedaugd Frölich family in that area. First involved was our own corps, I'm Groot Oom Corps from Vestvaugd. He was captured in 1944, tortured and died in prison for hiding, uh, for underdogging activities and false papers. When he was captured, my father, Corps Shipper, stood in and took care of the 40 families that were being hidden at the time. They were Verzetsman in North Holland. Unbelievably, in war, Sabine, my mother, and Corps fell in love. If you are from the elders family, please raise your hand. Hello, elders family, welcome. The elders family, led by Burgemeister Jan Elders and matriarch Jo Elders. There's Jan and Jo, Han and Jo. I guess there's a, became became the final hiding place of the Frolich family from mid-1944 through Befreidingsdag, 1945. The, uh, the elders' Frolich story is documented by our dear friend Leo Wiegman. Raise your hand, Leo. Leo Wiegman, uh, because his mother, Wilhelmina Elders, kept a diary of that year with my grandfather, Georg Frolisch, and they wrote every day of what happened. Um, and that, that story was beautifully put together by Leo and became the beginning of our understanding of the history of our family. 
Um, if you look carefully at the stones, you'll see that Bovenkospel is where Georg, Edith, and Sabine were liberated on the Freidingsdag. So when you see Budel, it's the Asperg family who started the process. When you see Bovenkospel, it is the elders' family who completed the process. Mm. The story of all of these four families is told, and more families, is told in much greater detail by my sister Agnes in her book called Sabine's Odyssey. And today is the publication day of that book. Tomorrow. It has to be, they have to be printing now. You can pre-order it today. We, the Schipper family, Agnes, Dorothea, Andreas, Christopher George, and Timothy, Oh, all of you, a debt of gratitude. Without, without you and your families, we would not be here. With you, we place these four stones for George, for Edith, for Andreas, and our mother, Sabine, who are symbolic with the help. One second. <laughs> I should have had a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Who are symbolically reunited after 81 years in front of the home where they were last together. Amanda, thank you for this. This was their final residence before they went into hiding. To close, I refer to the Latin preface written by my grandfather Georg in the House Elastic Wartime Diary. He wrote in Latin, Ubi caritas et amor Deus ibi est. Where there is charity and love, there is God. It was also the saying of Han Asper, I believe. Thank you for all attending. And now my sister Agnes will give a slightly briefer talk. <laughs> because there were so many children and they talked too much, so they had to leave, take her out of there within five days. But Trudy and my mother became lifelong friends. They corresponded, especially over email, and Trudy shared some of her memories, which I incorporated in the book. Mm. Melanie Burke and Nikki. Nikki King came here all the way from Ware, England, where Andreas attended school in 1939. He attended a pre-seminary school there. Um, they placed a memorial for him and also commissioned uh, a play about Andreas. So, significant ties there. Art Streifland. Um, Art Streifland, we came across him because he was writing a history of Fons Vitae and somehow found my mother uh, and wrote about her story for the history. And he also kindly located a photo of my mother holding the flag for the school on Liberation Day. Oh. That's in the book. Thank you, Ad. And next to Ad is Pauline McHales, his wife, an author, a historian, a publicist, and also someone who kindly read an advanced copy of the book and wrote a review. Thank you. Um, and then, of course, Elizabeth Hank, my publisher. Um, thanks to her, my book, um, Sabine's Odyssey, A Hidden Child and Her Dutch Rescuers, will be published tomorrow. I'm so grateful that the story of the Freilichs uh, can be told and added to Holocaust literature. Many of you here today um, are from families who are featured in how the Fröhlichs survived. Chris asked me to say a few words about Andreas. 
Today is a bittersweet occasion. The sweetness, of course, is the celebration of the survival of George, Edith, and Sabine Fröhlich. The bitter part is the premature death of the fourth family member, Andreas. Today we also honor and acknowledge Andreas and mourn him. It was Andreas's friend, Bob, Rob Wagenaar, who made the first contacts with the uh, Fossettes, the resistance in North Holland about hiding the three Fröhlichs. Amsterdam became a very dangerous place for any uh, person of Jewish ancestry to hide. And as Chris has said, uh, Andreas is indirectly responsible for our existence. <laughs> Had they not been able to go out to the countryside and survive, we five shippers, uh, shipper children, 14 shipper great our grandchildren and eight now great-grandchildren would not exist, would not be here. Andreas was born on October 14, 1921. This is the photo that hung in my mother's room for decades. And it shows kind of what a very sweet and shy child he was. His sister Sabine was the opposite. <laughs> a talkative, headstrong tomboy. She hated doing embroidery, needlepoint, and all those things that girls were supposed to do then, so Andreas would do it for her so she wouldn't get into trouble. When she got into trouble, which was often, he would come to her room and comfort her. Sabine said he was very protective of her. Andreas was quite religious and hoped to become a priest. After Kristallnacht and the Nazi laws banned him from attending his Catholic school, he was evacuated from Germany and enrolled in St. Edmund's College. Uh, he wrote in his diary while he was in Brussels on his way to England to attend St. Edmund's, and I'm quoting directly, since I was forced by law to leave school, all of a sudden, I came to the big question of choosing a profession. Only two areas would be possible for me, either philosophy or theology. Of these two areas, I chose, after a long process of weighing, theology. I am well aware of the great sacrifices I will have to make and know that any practical profession must be considered if it will be a blessing to help my parents. Most beautiful and highest would be if I could study in the Vatican and bring God's holy gospel to the world. The diary that he wrote in has been donated to St. Edmund's College. This is the last photo of Andreas. It was taken in May 1941 for the Hope for Visa. So they could get uh, to Ecuador via Spain. They had been waiting for US visas, which never came through. On June 11th, 1941, Andreas was arrested in that building, then part of Pension Oliva. Because of the outcry surrounding the violent arrests of young Jewish men in the first razia by the German, uh, German Green Police and the strike that followed in February of 1941, the Gestapo conducted their second razia by stealth, by secret. Sabine was just 14 years old and realized too late that the two plain-clothed young men who had asked for her brother by name were actually Dutch policemen working for the Gestapo sent to round up 300 innocent young Jewish men in retaliation for an act of sabotage. Sabine, Edith, and Georg never saw Andreas again. He died four months later in the Mauthausen concentration camp. It was very important to Sabine that Andreas not be forgotten that he not just be a Holocaust statistic. She never stopped missing him, and the trauma of losing him haunted her in the last months, in particular, of her life. I found an email she wrote to me in December 19, 
uh, December 9, 2016, so that would have been about seven months before her death. Quote, I keep dreaming that Andreas came to visit. He had escaped the camp and found work, and then he found me on the internet. In 2017, she began having hallucinations that her brother had escaped the Nazis in Holland, had survived, and was now looking for her. She became distraught that she had become so old that he would no longer be able to recognize her. It was really hard to reason with her and comfort her in those last months. I think Sabine would be comforted today, knowing that his name is inscribed on a Stolperstein and that Andreas will not be forgotten. Here is evidence of a real person with real hopes and real dreams who once lived on this street. Here is a reminder of the cruelty and senselessness of his early death and the trauma inflicted on his family. Thank you all for coming on this event, a solemn celebration of a life lost, but also three lives saved. Thank you all. It's very meaningful. Please come walk with us to Bondle Park. We have an area set aside at the Blauke House uh, for a reception, and we'd love to hear stories, love to meet you in person, love to say thank you again for all you've done. Uh, and if you're coming with us, just you just need this little armband, and that will give you all access. So please hand those out. It's a, a 15 minute walk, uh, and it's basically follow uh, Prince Hendrik Land, Ehenstrat, and then the entrance to the choir. Um, there are more. Uh, where are more of the bracelets? Isabel? Yeah. Uh,